So thanks for uh, coming out to Influences, y'all. We appreciate you coming. I'm John Sharp. I'm Colleen Macklin. And Colleen is sitting in a chair, not because she is lazy, but rather she has a broken foot. When somebody so, says, like, break a leg at your panel, you know, you can just literally it. do it. She did it. So uh, Colleen and I collaborate a lot together on things like conference sessions. We're part of a company, Local Number 12, with Eric Zimmerman, uh, our game Metagame. It's on Kickstarter right now. Woo. We'd appreciate support. We're also faculty at Parsons, the new school for design. Uh, we teach games in aside a program that is very much not about games. Um, perhaps that leads us to why we would do a session like this. Yeah. So up until now, most of this conference has been about games. We focused our conversations on games, how we make them, what we're playing, uh, how to get people to know about them, how to sustain ourselves and our companies, how to monetize, free to play, how to monetize and free to play. Etc. Cetera, et cetera. <laughs> but we forget that games are part of a much larger universe, right? Um, we have done extensive research in our roles as faculty, and we have identified exactly where games are in the uh, galaxy. So that's the primary takeaway, I think, from this talk. Thank you very much. Yeah. But what about all the thing, other things we can learn from and be inspired by, like film, music, spelunking? Yes. For example. So this is a session about everything but games that influences the work of a group of four game developers. Colleen and I also um, draw from many things outside of games. I, for some reason, have a PhD in art history. Um, one of the things that I learned from, one of the artists I learned from, is Giotto, 14th century Italian painter. And from him, I learned the power of minimalism and of focus. How can you distill things down to their minimal essence to intensify an experience? How can you remove and prune and refine to get down to where you can really enhance and draw attention exactly where you want it to be. So while John was getting his PhD, I was hanging out in raves. I have my foundation, my doctorate in rave culture in New York City. Um, so as a, I was a VJ, I would DJ sometimes too, but in New York City, there was weekly iteration. Uh, coding, I was doing a lot of coding, learning how to make things interactive. So for the people who didn't want to dance, they could play with the visuals or change the environment. Uh, we were part of a learning community. We shared a lot of knowledge. Uh, and I feel like there's a real parallel to this scene in the 90s uh, to where we are today in sharing knowledge as a game design community. For me, Samuel Beckett and this quote, ever tried, ever failed, no matter, try again, fail again, fail better. I literally have it tattooed on my chest. <laughs> it, for me, it, it's meant a lot personally and professionally. That it's okay to fail. It's a huge part of what we do as game designers, right? Any of us who subscribe to a play-centric way of making our games, we live by this every day. This, this is the mantra for me. It helps me remember that failure is essential, and without it, I'll never be better. John might show you that tattoo later if you ask him. Um, <laughs> so I also, uh, currently, I'm really influenced by, by writing and by different authors. These are some quotes from George Saunders, who I would kind of call a uh, David Foster Wallace with soul. Um, <laughs> So he's, he's incredible. His writing makes me, makes me feel so many different things. But I think a lot of it's about surrealism and random perceptual um, connections that illuminate how weird it is to be a human. And also he talks a lot about death and deals a lot about mor with mortality. Um, so I think there is some relationship to human fallibility, failure, and his writings that as designers of failure, as game designers, we can learn a lot from. So yeah, there's lots and lots of ways for us to be influenced by things outside of games, to enhance our games, to make them better, to make us better practitioners of whatever part of game development we happen to be involved in. We've got four awesome people here today that have agreed to uh, share some of their external influences. Richard Lamarchand, Kelly Santiago, Ben Esposito, and Brenda Romero. First up, 
we've got Richard Lemershawn. Come on up, Rich. Yay. So Rich is probably best known for his work on the Uncharted series. Uh, more recently, he has joined the ranks of the professors uh, at the University of Southern California in their interactive media and games program. Uh, he's also a DJ. You've got a little rave in you, Richard. Uh, uh, he's been found spinning at uh, several different game-oriented parties under names like DJ Philippe Le Marchand and DJ Cerberus, of which we're part of, the three-headed beast. My fellow DJs. <laughs> Take it away, Rich. Thanks, Colleen. Uh, and uh, thank you for that lovely uh, introduction. Um, it's a real honor to be on a panel like this today among such uh, esteemed company. Um, it says in the program that I was going to talk about um, Georgians and Victorians, but I'll have to tell you about uh, my heroes Mary Wollstonecraft and William Morris another time. I decided to narrow my focus. Um, because I am very interested in realism in video games. Uh, now, for what I want to talk about today, I don't mean realism in the sense of improved physics or better lighting, though I am very interested in those things too. Today, I mean realism in the sense of the realist artistic movements in painting, literary fiction, and film, which emerged in the middle of the 19th century and which have been present in the arts ever since. The original goal of realism was to show what life is like for ordinary people uh, without any kind of romantic idealization or sentimentality or overdramatization. Of course, for hundreds of years, most of the pictures that got painted were portraits of, of kings and popes, the ruling classes, um, or those paintings were related to their lifestyles. And when other kinds of people were shown, it was usually through some kind of ideological lens that really distorted how those people were shown. Now, realism wanted to redress that imbalance. I think it's fair to say that when games draw narratively from film and literature, they usually draw from genre film and genre fiction, mostly science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Now, I um, loved genre fiction with a passion as a kid, and I still really love it. Um, in high school, I fell in love with the films of Terry Gilliam and David Cronenberg, who have mainly made genre movies, but whose works are transcendent in the way that all great art is. But as much as I love genre fiction, I think that if you're really paying attention to the world around you, there comes a point when you realize that real life is even more interesting than these kinds of fantasy worlds. So later in my teenage years, I started to see films by David Lynch, Mike Lee, Ken Loach, and Nick Rogue. And by the time I got to college, I'd become a fully-fledged art house cinema fan. Uh, I saw a lot of weird experimental film, a lot of international cinema, and a lot of great drama. And eventually I realized that many of the films I liked best, which had the deepest emotion and, the, uh, and that were most helpful to me in figuring out what life is all about, uh, were set in the real world and were about the extraordinary situations that we regularly encounter in everyday life. Now, what do we mean when we talk about realism in cinema? Well, there are probably lots of ways to trace that history, but here's just one of them. A good starting point, I think, is Jean Renoir, uh, a French writer and director. Uh, he was the son of the Impressionist painter Pierre-Auguste Renoir. In 1937, Renoir released a film called Grand Illusion. Uh, it's about the relationship between a group of people in a prisoner of war camp during World War I as they work together on an escape plan across the boundaries of their nationality, their social class, and ethnicity. Now, Orson Welles cited this as one of his favorite films of all time. Uh, and it has an authenticity and a kind of a generous attitude to its characters that was pretty rare in film at that time. Um, and it's an amazing film. It's one of those films where two hours just flies by like that. I can't recommend it highly enough. So jumping forward a decade to the end of World War II, uh, and the Italian film industry had suddenly been freed from the censorship imposed on it by Mussolini's fascist government. Influenced by Jean Renoir, uh, a group of film critics took advantage of their newfound creative freedom to kickstart the cinematic movement now known as neorealism. They began to make films about the lives of regular people, often using non-actors, and filmed on location against the beautiful but poverty-stricken background of uh, post-war Italy. Now, one amazing film to come out of this uh, movement is Bicycle Thieves uh, from 1948. It's about a father searching Rome for his stolen bicycle, a bicycle without which he will lose the job that feeds his young family. 
A few years later, Italian neorealism lit the fuse for the French New Wave of cinema, which was also founded by young film critics longing for innovation and working in collaboration with older French filmmakers who wanted to bring their experience to do something new. I'm sure you guys have heard of the French New Wave uh, and its key directors, Jean-Luc Godard and Francois Truffaut. My personal favourite film from this time is Truffaut's The 400 Blows. It's a loosely autobiographical story about a misunderstood kid getting into trouble with the system. By the way, I think it's really interesting to note that in both of these historically important film movements, critics um, that had been writing about film became filmmakers themselves. And their work caused tremendous change all throughout the world. So even though the directors of the French New Wave were often reacting against a lot of Hollywood convention, they ended up being massively influential on the next generation of Hollywood filmmakers, everyone from Steven Spielberg to Martin Scorsese. And in just the same way, in games right now, critics and writers like Matty Bryce, Cara Ellison, and Tom Francis are becoming game designers. Uh, And the work that they're making is feeding right back into the mainstream of games in many positive and uh, very healthy ways. Anyway, so that's some historical setup for realist film. There are lots more reference points that you guys probably know about, from the 1960s kitchen sink dramas of the British New Wave to the gritty realism of the 60s and 70s American filmmaking. And, of course, there were lots of uh, similar uh, movements in international cinema. Um, As just one example, the work of Indian directors like Chetan Anand. But now I want to tell you about a few great recent realist films that have had a big influence on me and that I think might not be very well known in our community of game makers. In 1999, the Scottish director Lynn Ramsey released this moving film called Ratcatcher. Um, The movie's innovative cinematography and editing was described as immersive by some critics, which I think is interesting in relation to games. And it showed that you can always find new things to do with an artistic form if you work at it. Uh, In games, I think we've barely begun to push cinematography in the way that this film does, in terms of unconventional framing and impressionistic use of light and unconventional editing, stuff like that. Um, The movie's set in Glasgow in the early 70s, and like several of the films uh, I want to tell you about, it's about a kid from a challenging background, Uh, this boy James. He's patiently waiting for his family to be relocated to a new public housing uh, project as he tries to deal with a fallout from something bad that recently happened to him. Coincidentally, another of the films I want to tell you about uh, is set in Glasgow, one of two films that uh, I'll tell you about by another British director, Andrea Arnold. Red Road from 2006 was made in response to a game-like project where a group of uh, Danish and German film producers challenged three different filmmakers to use a number of the same predefined characters in three different movies. Red Road was the first movie to be made in response to this challenge. Uh, It's about a woman who works monitoring police closed-circuit television feeds from public housing projects. Uh, And in doing so, she encounters a man from a very bad part of her past. And these issues around voyeurism and surveillance have been explored a bit by Gaines, uh, and I think they're an interesting fit for interactivity. And maybe this film shows us some new creative ways forward. Uh, The main character in this film, by the way, you might recognize. uh, She's played by the brilliant Kate Dickey, uh, who also plays uh, Lissa Aaron in Game of Thrones. Andrea Arnold's next film, uh, Fish Tank, um, is one of those rare films that manages to be both funny and heartrending. It's about an isolated teenage girl whose only real passion is hip-hop dance as she struggles to find her way through life and to try and connect with the world. It's got Michael Fassbender in it, I'm sure you know. Uh, He's done a lot of amazing work, including his turn as Archie Hickox in Inglorious Bastards. And uh, first-time actor Katie Jarvis is really brilliant in the main role. Another British realist film that I think some of you might have seen is Weekend, directed by Andrew Hay. Now, this is a very powerful and moving film about two men who hook up on a Friday night, beginning what initially just seemed like a casual sexual encounter. But as the relationship unfolds over the course of the weekend, the film manages to explore big issues around intimacy and commitment, uh, as well as leading a political discussion about what life is like for gay people in contemporary society. And like um, a a number of other realist films, this movie has great sort of documentary feel uh, that comes from its camera work, its lighting, and its naturalized dialogue, uh, some of which was improvised. 
Um, as game storytelling matures, I think we're going to see these kinds of techniques coming more and more to the fore in various kinds of cinematic games. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't quickly tell you about two star directors of contemporary realist film, these guys, Jean-Pierre and Luc Dardenne, better known as the Dardenne brothers. Um, this Belgian duo started out making features and documentaries in the 70s and then began to build an international following with a sequence of very naturalistic films about people struggling to get by in contemporary Belgian society. Um, any of their films would make a really great starting point for you guys, but The Kid with a Bike from a couple of years ago is incredibly powerful, and it's available to stream on your favorite digital movie service. Um, also, uh, if you are looking out carefully, there's an Uncharted 2 poster on a bedroom wall in one of the scenes. That's not why I chose this, but I couldn't resist telling you about that. And finally, I want to tell you about a really amazing movie that I saw in the theatre just a few weeks ago. Um, it's a groundbreaking film set in a part of the world that we don't often get a very clear view of, I think. Uh, it's called Wajda, uh, directed by Haifa Al-Mansur, and it's the first Saudi Arabian film in history to be directed by a woman. Funnily enough, it's another realist film that prominently features bicycles. I don't know what's going on there. Uh, it's about the title character Wajda's dream of buying a bike when everyone around her tells her that she shouldn't have one because she's a girl. Uh, this is a really understated and subtle movie, uh, and it's also very funny and moving, so check it out. Hopefully it'll come out online soon. So what kind of influence do these films have on me? Well, they make me long for more realist games, games about our day-to-day -day lives and experiences. Now, something you might notice about these films, many of them are about women, young people, and children. And these are groups that don't often receive very detailed or nuanced portraits in either films or games. And I don't think I'm the only one who's interested in this stuff. Some of the most interesting and impactful games of the past few years could be seen as realist games. Um, games like Anna Anthropy's Dysphoria, Richard Hofmeyer's Cart Life, Gone Home by the Fulbright Company, and I Get This Call Every Day uh, by David S. Gallant. Now, these games are about regular people struggling with the circumstances of their lives. And that makes these artworks valuable to us as individuals and as a society. So I'm very interested in emotion in games, and I think that we, as game designers, have a lot to learn from realist movies like the ones I've told you about today. These films work because they slow their pace, and they take the time to show the nuance in the dynamics of the relationships between their characters. And as a result, they offer emotional experiences that are as deep and as strong as any that we can find in the arts. So check out some of these films. I'm going to tweet the list and a few more that I didn't get time to talk about today. And I'll look forward to seeing how uh, they might influence your guys' game design practice. Thanks very much for your time. Cheers. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Rich. <clears throat> Next up, we've got Kelly Santiago. You probably know she was a big part of Journey. You probably know she is now the developer's best friend at Ouya. However, yes. did you know she uh, performed in a high school competition show choir just like we see on Glee every week? Um, a little known fact about Kelly. So come on up, Kelly. Awesome. They said send two facts to say. I didn't know what they meant, so <laughs> so you spoke. Um, whew, kind of nervous about this. Whoa, the font is super small. So when, when Colleen and John approached me about this panel, um, there was an artist that immediately came to mind. Um, the work of this artist has been with me so long, as long as I can remember, and I feel that many, many times over the course of my artistic life and my career in video games, um, his work has resurfaced again and again, and each time I find something new to take away from it. Um, it's as though his work, while it remains somewhat the same, kind of evolves along with me. And I think it must mean that that's a really deep, ingrained part of myself. Um, and I think it's led to some of the main guiding principles I bring to my work, uh, that they actually stem directly from his body of work. But I thought, uh, instead of trying to describe its impact, I think it's best to witness a sample um, so you can experience its potential impact on, on society. <laughs> Let's Wait, the link didn't work, though. 
Uh, hmm. Can I just go yeah. over? Okay. Yeah. Not the Atlantic. <gasps> That's, um, <laughs> where's my, anybody see my mouse? Oh, it's still on this there. screen. There. There you go. Oh, great. Perfect. As you figured out, it's Jim Henson and the Muppets. Um, so, yes, yeah, so while I was sort of setting up uh, a joke there, my introduction is still true. I revis revisit his work and his life over and over again and keep finding things that resonate with me and the things I've learned in my work. So I thought I'd share some of those themes and ideas with you. So one of my guiding principles I credit to Jim Henson is that it is about the journey Yes, pun in, not intended, maybe, but not the destination. Uh, goals are awesome and drive us to challenge ourselves and one another to achieve great things. But you can't gloss over those days in between deliverables. I don't believe that the ends justify the means. Um, the, the, and it's the means, those day-to-day -day experiences that really comprise the majority of our existence here on Earth. And I think that's important to remember. Um, Jim Henson really strived to create a working environment for his artists that was just as enjoyable to work in as the material that they were working on. And he wanted the people on his team to feel good day to day, and that translates into their work. Um, and I do believe that the experience you have while creating a work impacts the emotions felt through that work. I think audiences have an ability to perceive heart through a game. We often really get too focused on that next deliverable and not on the days we spend getting there. We spend most of our days with one another as co-developers on a game. And sometimes we spend more time with one another than we do with our family members and significant others. Um, and please remember that as I say this, that I am a huge advocate for the power of video games as a medium, for video games as art, and, the, and that games play a huge a hugely impactful role in our society, but at the end of the day, we work on fucking games. <laughs> like, there's nothing about that and what we do that's worth hurting ourselves, hurting one another, um, or, or the ones that we love. So we should definitely incorporate more musical numbers into our database process as well. So second is to be creative, you have to take risks, and in order to take risks, you have to feel that you're in an environment in which it is safe to fail. Um, this was really a motto of Henson's and certainly came, um, came out through many of the trials and tribulations that the Muppets faced in putting on a show every night. It's also one of the biggest mistakes I see happening in our industry, which somehow I, I feel is perpetuated this notion that everyone thrives better in a really competitive, hostile environment in which you're asked to prove yourself every day. And it, I think it's why we drive many brilliant, creative people away from making games professionally, um, and especially in the commercial marketplace. Uh, so this statement right here, it's the key to innovation. It's everything. So now I'm not saying that you have to create an environment in which everyone is pampered and everyone wins all the time. Um, I think you want to put together the right team for your game from the start. But once I've decided to work with someone, 
I give them enough rope to hang themselves with because that's when I think creative people produce their best work. You want a team of people that push and challenge one another because they come from different backgrounds. They're bringing different ideas to the table and all of those ideas can be heard. Um, that's how you get the best ideas, not by pitting a homogenous group of people against one another. And this point might seem um, a bit dodgy based on what I just said, but going back to my second point, the people you work with might, uh, you might as well be dating, really. You're in a, in a totally <laughs> committed relationship with them of ups and downs, and you have to work through problems, and, you know, and, and at times you're really stuck with each other. So you spend at least as much time with them as, as you would a significant, uh, significant other. And sometimes um, that person is the person that is perfect on paper to do the job that you want them to do uh, or that you need to get done on your project won't actually help you get your game done because working with them is such a chore or a challenge for you know whatever reason. Um, I have never successfully just handed off a chunk of work on a game to someone and just have them go away and do the work and come back. It's always um, required some back and forth and a relationship there. Uh, so conversely, I would rather change some of the aspects of my game that I'm working on in order to incorporate a person on my team who I think is brilliant and that I want to work with, but may not have those exact skill sets that I needed to get the game done as I was envisioning it. So if that makes sense. I would rather kind of curve the design of the game to incorporate a person onto my team that I really want to work with, because ultimately I think that game is way better. Moving away from team process, um, this aspect of the creative process has always been one um, I've held dear, and have, it's been shown to me time and time again to be true. I actually wrestled between kind of talking about David Lynch and Jim Henson for this reason, um, because I've found it to be so core. For those of you familiar with uh, my talks on game design process at that game company, uh, yes, it's important to have a core focus or theme for your project, and it's important to weigh features and work against that, against whether or not they'll achieve your goal for your game. Um, but sometimes I think you get that inspiration, or if you're not the lead creative on the project, the person you're working with will get that inspiration, and I believe you just got to go with it sometimes. Um, it may not always make logical sense, but um, you can feel that it's right. And I say at those moments, you know, let the critical study students make sense of this later. <laughs> well, they will. <laughs> you know, Henson was inspired to create Dark Crystal, uh, despite its obvious departures from the work that he was most famous for. And initial testings of the films were so bad that the distribution company was pulling so much of their confidence and support out of the project that Henson bought the film from them to distribute himself. Uh, initial box office was bad, and initial reviews were bad. Um, but, of course, we know it went on to become uh, one of the top 20 grossing films in America that year and has grown in critical and financial success ever since. So confession, uh, you know, sometimes when Genova and I are talking about our design process on one of the games that we published on, on PlayStation Network, um, it sounds so neat, our, our journey from inspiration into application in the game and how it ended up but it really looks at times a lot messier than that. And sometimes it is just, you kind of wake up and you, you see the scene and you know that's the scene, that you know that's how it's gotta be. Uh, and you kind of, in 2020 hindsight, can string the pieces together. But in the moment, you just, you're going on your gut. And in the end, sometimes you just can't take yourself too seriously. And silliness is a virtue. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Kelly. That was awesome. Um, I want to see like the comparison between Henson and David Lynch. I want to see that mashup. That just sounds incredible. Um, <laughs> so next up, we have Ben Esposito. Woo! So uh, Ben was a level designer for the PS3 game, The Unfinished Swan. Um, awesome game, and used to run a basement music venue in upstate New York. Was that your basement, Ben? Or? It was not my basement. All right, cool. Take it away, Ben. All right, hey. Um, I wanted to talk to you. Oh, okay, so I first wanted to say that um, I think, like, 
film definitely influences my work a lot, but I would say music probably does more. And so my background is, I, a lot of it is from music and electronic music. Um, and so I want to talk about Brian Eno, who is one of the most influential electronic musicians, um, or, or like, did uh, whatever, like synthesizer uh, and electronic music. Um, so he's also the most quotable guy on the planet. So I'm going to show you quotes, and um, I'm going to, if you talk to me afterwards, I'll give you some resources for like awesome stuff that, like interviews and stuff that he said. Um, so the kind of the main idea I wanted to to start with was um, this one quote, which says, "The idea is to produce things that are as strange and mysterious to you as the first music you ever heard." Um, and to me, that's kind of like a goal with a lot of my work is to reproduce those kind of like magical experiences that you you didn't quite understand at first. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try to like tie that back up. Um, so if you don't if you're not familiar with Brian Eno's work, um, he's known for work, uh, working with David Bowie and Devo and Talking Heads. He also produced um, uh, like Coldplay and U2 for more contemporary. Um, he popularized the term ambient music, and he also popularized the term generative music. Um, with his album Discrete Music um, that I'm going to talk about a little bit later, um, which was kind of both ambient and generative. Um, he's also known for some video ins uh, video and installation art. Um, 77 Million Paintings was one of his like generative works that is kind of like generative paintings set to generative music, and the idea is that there's 77 million possible combinations. And it would take you like 450 years of watching it to see all of them. Um, okay, so first I wanted to I wanted to talk about how I was introduced to Brian Eno. So um, I'll play with you the first piece that I ever heard, and it was like pretty influential to me. Um, and so I'm gonna make sure it sounds on. All right, um, and so uh, you might have heard this this song too. Uh, so I'll play it. So it's six seconds long. Um, it's, uh, if, if you don't know where it's from, it's the Windows 95 startup sound. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, Microsoft commissioned him to um, produce like a piece of music that was kind of like, they, they used every possible adjective to describe this piece of music. It's like futuristic and nostalgic and sentimental. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, he wasn't like a big fan of Microsoft, but he did think the challenge of making a three-second piece of music was was incredible and kind of funny. So um, I think that's like a, a kind of good encapsulation of a lot of the stuff he, he talks about. Um, so what's important uh, to Brian Eno is theory over practice. Uh, and it's something that... <laughs> I kind of subscribe to too, where like there is like certainly a craft to music and there's a craft to developing games and and any form of art. But uh, in terms of being an artist, like I think process is the most important thing to me. Um, so uh, Brian Eno has all of his work is informed by like a specific theory or process that he wants to explore. Um, and so he says like even though your even though the viewer or the listener or the player might not. Uh, understand or like be aware of the theory behind what they're experiencing. It's the fact that it informed it meant that it, it could create an experience that uh, they might not have otherwise seen. Um, so uh, the next thing I want to talk about is constraint. Um, so he's got this other great quote. Um, There's a reason that guitar players invariably produce more interesting music than synth players, and it's that you can go through the options on a guitar in a minute. After that, you have to make aesthetic and stylistic decisions. Um, and so I think this applies to um, uh, digital artists because, like, when the synth synthesizer came out, um, it's got all these knobs, and you kind of have infinite an infinite amount of options, um, and that often makes it way more difficult for you to <laughs> produce anything interesting. Um, and so, yeah, this this quote kind of ties it up nicely, where he says, "What you need are fewer possibilities that are more interesting." And so, what he wants to create are constraints that allow you to be making uh, aesthetic and stylistic decisions rather than technical decisions. Um, okay. So I want to talk about one of his most famous works, uh, Discrete Music. Um, it's a piece of ambient music, and it's a piece of um, generative music. And I'll, and I'll describe what ambient music means. You probably are, are familiar with it now, but um, the story behind the album is that Brian Eno got into a car crash, and he was recovering in bed, and he um, wanted to listen to music. And so he had a record of like classical harp music. And so he got up, and he like mustered all his strength to put the record on. 
and he, and he moved the needle on, and he, he went back and laid in bed, and then couldn't really hear the music. And it turns out the volume was down to an almost imperceptible level, um, but he, was, he felt too weak to go and turn the volume up, so he decided to listen to the music at this almost imperceptible volume. And so it kind of came in and out of consciousness. And that was, oh, this is his quote, uh, this presented what was for me a new way of hearing music as part of the ambience of the environment, just as the color of the light and the sound of the rain were parts of that ambience. So ambient music is about the gray, kind of like gray area between attention and background. Um, and so that's kind of an area I really enjoy exploring in my work, where instead of kind of like upfront systems and, and game mechanics, I think uh, creating environments and worlds that dance between like things that are worthy of attention, things that are the background, are kind of the most interesting places uh, to explore. Um, and then the other part of discrete music is that it's generative. And what that means is that um, the piece is started with a seed, and then some other process that is set up by the artist finishes the work for you. And so you don't necessarily have control over the final product. You just started it. And that's kind of um, video games and, and uh, software does this really well, um, but it kind of was being explored for <laughs> generations and generations before that in other forms of art. Um, and so uh, on the back of discrete music, uh, he generously reproduced the diagram of how the work was produced. It's a 30 minute piece. Um, and the idea is that it starts on a synthesizer and then goes into a tape recorder. And then that tape goes to a tape player, which goes back into the tape recorder and then gets recorded. Um, and so the idea is he starts with a synth line, um, and there's kind of like an idea, a melodic idea behind it, and then it feeds back onto itself at a different point in time, and he can stretch, he can stretch the delay and make it shorter or longer to kind of create new, new results that were unexpected. Um, and that was in <laughs> amazing at the time, um, and the technology allowed that. But it's something that we can... Uh, something uh, we can do now where we can plant the seeds of, and have an intention behind it, but I think letting the viewer take hold of what that means and how like the system affected it is is like some is really important to digital works. So I want to talk a little bit about um, this game. Um, so this game is the Unfinished Swan. If you don't know it, it's it starts and it's all white, and you throw black paint to reveal the environment. Um, and this was kind of, <laughs> for me, like an, an ambient game in a lot of ways. So there's not much gameplay other than kind of getting from point A to point B. Um, and a lot of the level design, um, like the focus for me on the level design was were things that were ambient. So like because there is no like gameplay per se, interacting with um, like other agents in the system, I wanted all the details and objects and backgrounds to take the place of that and kind of be able to go in and out of your consciousness um, and your attention. So uh, this is uh, a deck of cards called Oblique Strategies. Um, this has more to do with his idea of constraint and I think has helped inform my process a lot. Um, so. Oblique Strategies is a deck of cards that's uh, a bunch of challenges or dilemmas for to help you get over blocks in your work. Um, these are a couple of examples, like honor thy error as a hidden intention. And the idea is when you're blocked, you can take the card out, and a lot of them are kind of funny and, and will make you laugh. Um, and that's really important to to the idea because um, I think, and what Brian says is like when you react to something uh, as a, like with a laugh, it kind of means that it's there's some like truth to it that you had probably hadn't considered like it's a it's a subversion of expectations and so i think these are really useful literally but also just uh in the sense of creating a constraint that you maybe didn't have control over will help you become like way more creative um so this is my current game it's called kachina it uh you control this hole in the ground and you move it around and stuff falls inside um <laughs> and it gets bigger every time um, so this came out of a game jam, and I think game jams are 
really important to game development, not necessarily as a way of starting a game, but just in terms of uh, having a constraint for your process that will help you come up with brand new ideas and innovative solutions. So in the case of a game jam, your artistic constraint is time. Um, and the time constraint led me to this art style um, because it's so simple. Um, and it's 3D, but it's, it's all flat shaded. There's no lighting. Um, and then also the mechanic and focusing on one thing that I found interesting. Um, so uh, for me, uh, this game is interesting because you don't control an avatar. You control a hole, which is negative space. Um, and the entire game is physics driven. So all these objects are physically simulated and they have their own, and the characters have their own kind of like very simple rudimentary AI. Um, and all you're doing is kind of just playing with that system. And there's a couple puzzles, but it's a lot of it is just kind of seeing what happens when you remove things from a scene and when you add them back and if they change or not. Um, and so the whole, uh, so Brian Eno, um, you uh, started in like pop music, and then he started, and then he started to do ambient music, and removed his own voice. And he thought removing his voice was really important to the work, because the voice is, if you put a voice in music, it kind of focuses all your attention on it. Um, and so this is his quote about removing the voice. He says, "If I'm not there taking them through the audience, uh, then it's an empty space for them. They can move into it, and they can go through in their own way." And so that's kind of a framework for me in terms of design. So in this case, we remove, I remove a lot of authorial control in terms of the physics simulation. Um, but I also remove your avatar and any kind of like thing to hold on to within that simulation. Um, and I think it, it allows you to kind of be inside of that system uh, instantly rather than having to like rely on a lot of narrative immersion that I don't think is necessarily important. Um, so I wanted to talk one more, one more time about the Windows 95 sound, how it encapsulates everything. Um, <clears throat> so the, the challenge was to create uh, this three and a, a, a one-fourth second song. Um, and so he, he, he said, uh, this was really funny because um, to make that piece of music that contained all those ideas was like a, an incredibly silly challenge. Um, but he took it up, so um, it, it, and he used these like three ideas of like having a guiding theory, um, having an incredibly, incredibly rigid constraint of three seconds, although he did produce this song that was six seconds, um, but also that his reaction to it, his gut reaction of it being kind of like a ridiculous idea helped guide him towards producing like much more interesting work because he never would have uh, explored that kind of like super compressed time space without that. Um, so I'm, I'm Ben Esposito again. This is my Twitter if you want to talk to me about uh, some more materials like documentaries and interviews and stuff. I'd be totally happy to share. So thank you very much. All right. Uh, and next up, we've got Brenda Romero. Serious OG in the game industry, 32 years inside and out, games that are plugged in and are not plugged in, an amazing variety of work. Right now, she's uh, the program director at UC Santa Cruz, uh, master's program in games and playable media. Come on up, Brenda. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to move this back. I talk fast. I've only had two cups of coffee this morning. It could be a little slower. Okay, it doesn't want to go back. All right, um, so today I'm going to talk about Jackson Pollock. Um, Jackson Pollock, I, he's a huge inspiration of mine. He's a, a, a painter. Um, I, I'm not sure, actually, when I first become aware of Jackson Pollock. Um, my, my guess is that even that my first... My first uh, knowledge that he even exists as an artist was probably not this, that Jackson Pollock was a great artist, which is certainly something I believe today. My guess is that, that I, I heard about it like this uh, much more obviously. Jackson Pollock was someone who threw paint at a canvas and would have been excellent in Unfinished Swan, in fact. Uh, it's a nice <laughs> setup. I don't know if you paired those together on purpose. Um, but of course, anybody can make a Jackson Pollock painting, right? I mean, and we all know, you know, good job, mom and dad, you can do Jackson Pollock on your nails if you'd like to. You know, the kids can do Jackson Pollock 
in the backyard, and there's this fucking idiot on YouTube, you know, telling how everybody can be, this guy's such a tool, how everybody can be uh, Jackson Pollock. And then you can have accidental Pollocks on your shoes if you, if you really get involved in it. But absolutely none of them, so this is a piece called Number 11, uh, absolutely none of them has the beauty and the passion and the movement, the intensity of a real Pollock. A real Pollock is breathtaking. A real Pollock can bring me literally to tears just, just being there in their presence. They're beautiful, beautiful works. And when I first start to study Pollock, it's, it's not a way you would think, but it's through level design. And, and let me tell you, tell you why. Um, it occurs to me that, that Pollock's process is not unlike a game designer's process. He's circling the canvas again and again, much like we might circle a level again and again, fine-tuning it here or there, creating the actual thing, the exact thing that we hope to create. And as he's moving around the canvas, so are we. Our canvas, of course, you know, comes in a whole variety of different ways, be it digital or non-digital. And what we're looking at when we see a Pollock painting isn't so much a painting, but the artifact of a painting experience. And to me, I feel like a game is an artifact of a game designer's play experience. And the thing I love about Pollock is Pollock was the fucking paint. He was literally the pedal to the metal. It doesn't get any better than that. He isolated and elevated the paint. If you see a painting of a house, if you see paintings of people, you see paintings of angels, whatever, you've lost sight of the purity of the paint. That's what he deeply cares about. And for me, Pollock was all about action. It was all about the movement, the motion, the depth, the rage, and the joy. In every single line of a Pollock painting, you can see how he was feeling. You can see, it, it's just like I, I mentioned before, an artifact of his painting experience. And the paint, even when it's dry, even when Pollock is long since dead, even when it's hanging on a museum wall, the painting is as real. It is still as moving. It's still as alive as it was before. And for me, Pollock is as pure as it gets as far as painting goes. And Pollock is also super alone. Now, this is a piece called Number 9A. Um, and Pollock, when he was doing this, nobody else was doing these things. I mean, granted, there was a lot of abstract expressionism happening, and those are who were, his peers were in the New York scene. But he wasn't, uh, he wasn't doing this with lots of other people. Um, in fact, he was not doing it with anybody. And he faced harsh criticism from his contemporaries. This particular line it is easy to detect the following things in all of his paintings. This is an Italian critic in Time magazine. Chaos, absolute lack of harmony, complete lack of structural organization, total absence of technique, however rudimentary, once again, chaos. You know, if this had been, this had been a review in GameSpot, it would have been a zero out of ten. And so Pollock replied to the author and just wrote, no chaos, damn it. Um, <laughs> And, you know, it, it maybe it, it, at the time, Pollock actually, you know, as much as he, he faced criticism, and in part he just felt really alone because nobody was doing what he was doing. Um, and he, so he, he actually had a lot of supporters, including Peggy Guggenheim and a lot of prominent critics who were saying, this guy's on to something. Uh, but he still never felt secure in his work, ever. And then he got a break that many of us as game developers would kill for. Life magazine ran an article in 1949 asking if he was the greatest painter in the United States. And whatever your profession is, just you know, is, is, is John Sharp the greatest game designer in the United States? And of course, it would be this moment where you'd think like, that's me mentioned in time. I'm going to immediately show my parents, right? But then there's the other 100 people in the room who are going, John Sharp's not the greatest game designer in the United States. So what the hell is this? I'm going to go to Twitter and start, you know. So, so for him, he, you know, fortunately he didn't have Twitter, right? Um, he didn't have, to, didn't have to deal with Twitter rage. Uh, but, but this is what his real, this is what the real world, you know, of course my perfectly scientific uh, estimation there. Pollock got a lot of praise, but the way he really saw it was much more like this. And, and because he, he, he painted the drip method from 1947 uh, until 1951, um, and at the peak of his fame, he walked away from it. So when people had known him, when they actually revered the work that he was doing, when people who said anybody could make a Pollock actually tried to reproduce a Pollock and tried to get in there some of the mathematical movements and moments that are in his paintings, uh, they were unable to do it. And so at the peak of his style, he walked away. Pollock was an alcoholic. He'd been sober for a while. Um, but he, he resumed drinking at some point, and within six years, he died. He created another... Uh, he, tried around, he tried to mess around with a lot of different styles, but, man, none of them had the beauty, the intensity, and, and the purity 
that none of them had the hymn, none of them had the Jackson that those those four beautiful years had. And so this is a this is a piece when I was at a, a really fucked up point in my life, a lot of bad shit had happened. Um, and I'd finished my level design study of Pollock quite a while before. And I was at a really fucked up point in my life. Like, like I said, a lot of bad shit had happened. And there's this painting, it's called The Deep. And, and you know, to this day, I don't know why I would stare at this painting. It's part of my process as a game designer. I just stare, I just stare at shit. I am working, God damn it. Um, <laughs> but, I'm, I, but I would stare at this painting, and I think, like, am I looking at the white? Am I, am I trying to see what's through it? Um, you know, what, what's happening in this painting? And, and to this day, you know, there's a lot of blue poles is, is often thought of, which is uh, number 11 I showed you before. It's often thought of as one of his best pieces. But to me, this is his most nuanced piece, man. It's just him and white and black, and it is just breathtaking. And I still don't even know really what it means, but it, it was at this very low point in my life. Um, and out of that low point in my life came a series of games that I'm still working on now. This is one of them called Train. And, and I wasn't intending. I was just doing these things because I had to, because I still have to. Uh, and for me, uh, maybe this is what it looked like. Maybe, like, even as I put this up here, I'm suffering a whole hell of a lot of imposter syndrome with the word amazing. So let's just put the word work there <laughs> uh, and stop making games. And that was some stuff people said, you know, Brenda Brathwaite, which was my name at the time. Um, you need to stop making games. You're hurting games. Uh, and so it looked like that probably, but it felt a whole hell of a lot like that. And the detractors seemed so incredibly loud. And so what at one point in time was my, me studying Pollock and, and, and looking at how his work could influence the work of level design in general, then somehow turned to be about me researching what I would need to know about Pollock many years later when I was at a breaking point. And Pollock, he became my inspiration and my support. Now, Pollock felt about paint the way I felt and still feel about game mechanics. And this is one of my favorite quotes of his. On the floor, I am more at ease. I feel nearer, more a part of the painting. Since I can walk around it, work from the four sides, and literally be in the painting. What the hell happened there? Okay, just the, uh, so it's supposed to, <laughs> there it is. That's art. Do it. It's supposed to say I'm on the table. I'm more at ease. I feel nearer to the game. And this way, I can walk around the work from all sorts of four sides and literally be in the game. And I remember when the PS4 conference happened, the big event, and I had this horrible feeling. I was saying to my husband, I'm like, I should be there. Why am I not there? And because I was not there, somehow I'm a failure. Somehow I fucked up. Somehow I'm not part of mainstream games where I have been since the beginning. And I'm looking at the work that my friends are doing. And my friends' games are, you know, some of my closest, dearest friends are getting Game of the Year nods, you know? And I'm not doing this. I'm doing something that doesn't even match a box that they're in. And I feel like I'm outside of the actual game industry, right? Instead of thinking maybe I'm pushing the fucking boundaries of the edge of that industry. And, and Pollock tells me that it's okay to be there, right? Like it's absolutely okay to be outside. I'm not missing anything by not being at the PS4 launch event. Um, and I find myself again and again referencing him when people say like, well, you have to make copies of Train. You have to. Well, no, I don't. No, and I'm still not going to. Pollock's not making 20 lavender mists for all the housewives and the house husbands who want it. Uh, Pollock, I love his, his you know, brutal compression of exactly what it is he deeply loves. You know, I don't care so much about graphics and cutscenes or story or, or audio. I just want to deal right now with the mechanics. And there's something I'm still puzzling about with Pollock. He, he, actually, got rid of, uh, he actually got rid of names. Uh, at some point in his painting. And he called this number 11. Like, he didn't even want the names to, to color what that paint could possibly be. He just wanted it as pure as it, as it could, could conceivably be in his world. Um, Pollock basically gives me permission, and he gives me permission to be here or, or to go even further if I want to, that I can do what I like to do and not worry about whether I'm going to be accepted and that it's all right to do stuff that none of my other peers are doing and that I don't necessarily need their approval or even my own because clearly I sometimes feel anxious about the stuff that I am working on. Pollock inspires me to match his dedication he inspires me to think about painting, a painting, designing in ways that I've never designed before. He inspires me to keep going, to keep exploring, and to keep doing what I feel called to do. Thank you. Woo! Woo! Yeah.
Thank you, Brenda. That was great. Awesome. You should do this part now. All right. So, uh, so we talked a little bit about Brian Eno, Jackson Pollock. That's where he lives now <laughs> on that star after the wreck. Um, of course, the Muppets. Nothing more important than the Muppets. George Saunders, the rave scene, Samuel Beckett, who I always want to call uh, either Thomas Aquinas or Thomas Beckett for some reason, but I managed to do it correctly today. Um, Realist Cinema, Giotto. But what about you all? What are your influences? What are the things that inspire you? If you take anything away from this, I think it's go back and think about something that isn't a game that's really meaningful in your work and how can you bring that into the process? How can that help change you and make you better as a developer? So thanks very much, you all. Thanks, everybody.